Hi, and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. It's Monday again. It's Sunday if you're in the slow part of the planet. And that means another horror movie double feature that I found in a newspaper that's 50 years old. In this case, it's another one from Hoyt's Horror House in Bondi Junction. The cinema that is for me, like the Sistine Chapel is for Catholics, only they didn't preserve it. And in this case, we've got a couple of amicus films, both of which are high quality. One was the first portmanteau horror movie made by amicus. And the other one is an interesting take on a classic horror story. Let's get started with the interesting take on a classic horror movie. This from 1971, I'm Monster, starring Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing and Mark Raven. This is a variation on the theme of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, only instead of calling them Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, for some reason they call them Charles Marlowe and Edward Blake. I'm not sure if they changed the names to protect the innocent, but there aren't too many innocent people in this one. Christopher Lee plays Marlowe, who is a psychiatrist in 1906 London, who is experimenting with the writings and research of Sigmund Freud, but he's also dabbling in drugs, because of course he is. In this case, he's created a drug which removes inhibitions from people. It's not like ecstasy or any of those other pharmaceuticals which have come along more recently than this film. It's an injection, and he's about to experiment on himself, and a cat comes in. And so he injects the cat with the formula instead. The cat goes mad as a meat axe starts running around, starts screeching, starts locking over lab equipment, and he beats it to death with a fireplace poker. Not the cat's fault, and I didn't like the character after that part. You don't go randomly injecting cats with unknown pharmaceuticals when there was a perfectly good monkey in a cage in the lab. Do the monkey first, keep it in the cage, see what happens. At worst, you end up with Charlton Heston looking at the Statue of Liberty. He's, he's broken up about beating a cat to death, as you, indeed you would be. Milo is ostensibly a nice person, but is he really? For a study inject of the cat. He then has a female psychiatric patient who has what seem to be depression issues and repression of her feminine instincts, let's say. And she's desperate, she wants to do anything she can to get her ducks lined up. And so he injects her. Ethical red flag there. And she doesn't turn into a monster. She turns into a woman who's fully aware of her own sexuality. And we get a bit of a fade out after she comes on to Dr. Marlowe. Christopher Lee was a good looking rooster at the time and the implication is either that he chloroformed her and knocked her out or he slept with her now she wakes up she thinks that she had a dream and so marlo again red flag big time not a nice guy and in spite of the fact that he knows that this is a dangerous chemical and he talks about it with a number of his friends one of whom's played by mike raven who was a dj on pirate radio ships in the 1960s and then went on to do a few things in horror i think he may have been in the vampire lovers not an impressive actor he's got a look but he doesn't have anything behind that one of the other friends is a guy called Addison played by Peter Cushing and Peter Cushing said this is his least favorite role and I'm not surprised because he gets bugger all to do in this movie. Inevitably Marlowe injects himself and becomes uninhibited because Edward Blake the alternative version of himself and there's some really great acting by Christopher Lee in this one. The transition between Marlowe and Blake is interesting. He's kind of discovering that he's got no inhibitions and he's delighting in the world around him for the first time he's not intently focused on his work and so at the start of this continuum of the alternate ego it's like a child being taken to the circus for the first time except no scary clowns and that's really subtly done by christopher lee but inevitably things progress and things get worse as the use of the pharmaceutical to create edward blake gets worse and worse blake becomes uglier he becomes repugnant he starts getting pustules on his face he's his grooming goes to hell it becomes a metaphor for drug addiction as indeed is dr jekyll and mr hyde for that matter things get really 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 bad he beats a woman to death because she rejects him in a pub and again that's something which has some quite tragic real world parallels and meanwhile Utterson is slowly figuring out through some minor detective work that Marlowe and Blake are the same person their handwriting is the same. Marlowe has changed his will and left everything to Blake because he gets the suspicion that it may come to the point where Marlowe no longer exists and Blake is 
his whole identity. And we get to the point where an ejection is required for Blake to become Marlowe. And that doesn't last very long. The makeup work on here is incredibly subtle. The makeup artist Roy Ashton did some interesting work where he slowly built up the transition physically between Marlowe and Blake. At first, Blake looks like Marlowe, but with a slightly rattier wig, because the wig Christopher Lee wears as Marlowe is incredibly distracting to me. We also get an interesting little vignette at the, towards the start of the film, where Marlowe injects one of his other patients, a guy called Dean, who's a brutish businessman, who's one of those, yeah, people need to work harder kind of businessmen, played by an Australian actor called Kenneth J. Warren. It's a hard job, and it takes a hard man to do it. So when are you going to tell me something? What the hell do you think I pay you for? I want results! And he gets to have a little star turn in this as well, where he goes from being the kind of bullish capitalist, and the drug enables him to revert to an abused child that he was in the past. No, no, not again. No, don't hurt me again. Don't hurt me. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Oh, 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 it hurts. We see Kenneth J. Warren doing that transition to a child who was abused by a parent. Now, whether that abuse was sexual or only physical isn't particularly clear but it's, it's a solid little vignette because it shows us that this drug whatever it is and however it manifests long term has some really useful psychiatric purposes and the movie does that subtly it's just a side note to the main narrative which is good versus evil though as with the best dr jekyll and mr hyde adaptations the supposedly angelic Dr. Jekyll isn't. He is at least morally closeted and that again makes for a, a quite an interesting arc. Or to, by the way I'm looking forward to seeing the version of Dr. Jekyll with with Susie Ezzard in it because even though it got bad reviews I want to see how that plays out in the 2020s with a trans character. It's going to be an interesting one. It's a progression from Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde in an incredibly interesting direction. But leaving that aside, this one, even though it is a relatively low budget, gives us an interesting version of the story. Christopher Lee, uh, it's easy to forget how good an actor he was. Yes, he played monsters and vampires and Frankenstein's monster and the mummy and Dracula and all of that stuff most of which didn't require too much of him and too much of his skills. But in this one, uh, we go from the ostensibly noble Charles Marlowe to a brutish and violent character who becomes grotesque physically as well as morally. And Lee hits every note spot on with that. This movie was going to be originally released in a 3D process, which seems a bit ropey. I've looked into the mythology for it, and, and I can't understand how it works, where one side of the pair of glasses you need to wear is darker than the other, and it gives a three-dimensional effect. Not sure how that works, but it's not the sort of movie that needs 3D particularly. House of Wax, yeah, I can understand it. Creature from the Black Lagoon, yeah, I can understand that too. But I Monster didn't really require it, so they ditched that in post-production. They cut out some bits and had to reshoot others to make it work. But it did. I remember seeing this, I think it was in the State Theatre in Sydney at the time. I didn't see it at Hoyt's Horror House, I know that. And I was kind of impressed with how it made Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde different, which is right there from the start. But you were never going to get Christopher Lee playing in a totally angelic character. The guy had lived through too much, particularly in his war service, for him to ever play an innocent. But in this one, he does do really, really well. And it's very instructive to watch his acting. Again, Peter Cushing wasn't given much to do. It's definitely a secondary, if not tertiary, character in the, in the narrative, even though they do get to have a bit of a fight in the lab where Dr. Marlowe did his experiments, and that inevitably ends to a tragic outcome. But yeah, it works for me. I, I remember dismissing this movie. I, I think I watched it on VHS back in the day, and I was a little dismissive of it, but this time around, I like it. I like what it does. I like the fact that it does it on a low budget. I like the fact that it brings out the best in Christopher Lee, and the idea of Dr. Marlowe, being a psychiatrist, fits comfortably into the arc of the story. That then takes us to the other part of the double feature, and this is 
my copy of it on Blu-ray from Olive Films, which was releasing a whole bunch of interesting things on Blu-ray back in the day. And it is Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, where Peter Cushing does get to have the main role and does get to show his acting chops, even though Christopher Lee is one of the characters in the movie. Got some black and white stuff on the back there. This is a solid release. I believe there have been UK releases of it as well. But at the time I got this, it was only available in the Olive Films Region A version. And this is Region Locked to Region A. Dr. Terrace House of Horrors was the first amicus the portmanteau horror films. It was directly influenced by Dead of Night, the 1945 Ealing portmanteau movie where you have a frame story and then a whole bunch of sub stories which are horror stories in this one five men get into a train carriage and sit down and then a sixth man dr shrek played by peter cushing gets on board and as the train progresses along its way to where it's going he starts doing tarot readings for the five other people and in those readings we then we then fade out into each of the stories and the stories are mixed, I'll be honest with you. There are one or two really sweet ones in this. In the order they've got, the first one is called Werewolf. And it stars Neil McCallum as an architect who's sold his family home on an island off the coast of Scotland to a woman called Mrs. Bidolf. And she asks him to renovate the house she wants to turn it into a museum for the heritage of her husband. And he comes back to the island and does that. And while he's doing the prep for the renovation, he discovers a coffin hidden inside the wall in the basement of the house. Things do not go well from there. A family curse is invoked and... It doesn't end well for the protagonist. It doesn't end well for any of the protagonists in this movie. That was kind of minor and slightly light, but it gives Ursula Howell, playing Mrs. Bidoff, a chance to do some interesting acting and inter interesting phasing from one type of character to another. The second one stars Alan Fluff Freeman, who was another DJ who was an Australian, but worked in England for a long time and was very into Leather Boys. He plays a guy called Rogers, who is coming back from a holiday with his family. And they find there's a weed growing up the wall of their house and the weed doesn't want to be uprooted. It knocks gardening equipment out of his hand. He gets a couple of scientists, played by Bernard Lee, M from the original James Bond films, and Jeremy Kemp to investigate this weed, which has a few unusual qualities for a plant. For a start, it's intelligent, for another thing, it's malevolent. And for a third thing, it learns. And even though, again, low-budget stuff, the way they evoke this mobile plant, which is not a triffid, it's more like a vine, is really good. It's a small piece, but it, it lands well. It does what it has to do well. Alan Freeman was never going to be a great actor, but he's plausible enough as a kind of family man who comes up against malevolent flora and i kind of like that one and i think that because he wasn't a particularly good actor bringing in jeremy kemp and bernard lee lifts things up and takes the acting and the plausibility of the absurd story to a level it needs to be the third one stars roy castle who was in one of those doctor who movies that peter cushing did even though he was a very versatile entertainer, he could do anything, sing, dance, play instruments, anything. I'm not sure he comes across really well on the screen in a narrative form. And he plays a jazz musician called Biff Bailey, who gets a gig on a Caribbean island. He is a voodoo rhythm that he's not supposed to hear and transcribes it and turns it into a kind of jazz composition. But the god Dumbala is not happy about that. Now, the interesting character in this isn't the character Biff Bailey, played by Roy Castle. It's a secondary character who's a singer, played by an English singer called Kenny Lynch. And Kenny Lynch, on the screen, totally overwhelms the mugging and, and the little bits of business that Roy Castle does. He does a number of bits of business, even in a frame story, which are attention-seeking. And I'm not sure that that's what you need in this kind of a narrative. But that one comes to a fairly predictable ending. Some people have said it's based on a story by Cornell Woolrich called Papa Benjamin, which I haven't read. But there's a possibility that the writer Milton Sabotsky, who was also one of the Abacus producers, may have borrowed significantly from another writer's work. 
The second last one is the one that really lands, and it's called Disembodied Hand. And Christopher Lee plays a pretentious and pompous art critic called Marsh. And Marsh is skating of a new art exhibition by an artist called Eric Landor, played by Michael Goff, who we know was Alfred to Michael Keaton's Batman later in life. And Michael Goff, who's a very mannered actor on screen in a lot of the things he did, particularly in the 1960s, works well as Landor. He's a bit flamboyant, he's very mocking and dismissive. He humiliates Marsh at the exhibition, and Marsh ends up getting writer's block and gets really pissed off with Landor and Landor keeps turning up at various things Marsh does and just standing in the back silently mocking him. Marsh inevitably snaps and runs over Landor with his car severing his hand. Landor commits because he can no longer be an artist which I don't believe is fair because artists have overcome many many disabilities in the past. Landor dies but his hand doesn't and his hand seeks revenge against Marsh. Christopher Lee again does some A-grade acting in this, playing the pompous, pretentious Marsh at the start and then crumbling under the slow-growing horror of what he experiences is something that Christopher Lee does. Well, that arc is dead smooth and he hits every beat perfectly. And as the tragic figure of Landor, who, to be fair, does stalk and goad Marsh until inevitably Marsh takes action. We still get a good solid arc of that character as well as for Marsh. So Landor and Marsh, the two actors are playing off against each other and each one of them hits everything it needs to hit. The disembodied hand is a little bit ropey and the, and the special effects work isn't great but it's serviceable and again it's the 1960s and uh, a lot of the prosthetic technologies I had at the time weren't as good as they would be in later decades. The last one's got Donald Sutherland in it, and he plays a doctor with a new beautiful French wife, played by Jennifer Jeans, and with the help of the other doctor in town, played by Max Adrian, he slowly discovers that his wife may be a vampire. And that one has a kind of inevitable and slightly silly ending to it, but I kind of like it. I think Donald Sutherland sells the silliness to us. And Max Adrian, who was a very theatrical actor, he was a good actor. I uh, saw him in a number of things. He's really good playing uh, an acrobat in a movie called Port of London, which you should see. And he gets to have the grace note at the end of that episode in a funny way. And then, of course, you have the end of the frame story and the credits roll. Dr. Terror's House of Horrors was big when I was a kid. It really hit Australian cinemas in the late 60s when some of the censorship around horror movie themes in movies was loosened a lot so it got re-released here and turned up in a number of cinemas it turned up at um, midnight on new year's eve at my local cinema for instance so it was put in rotation by the distribution company and people loved it i remember some kids who saw it at the midnight session were talking about it when i was a teenager and really selling the movie and it works well one of the things i'm trying to remember with doing these flashbacks is the way we perceive horror movies was totally different in the 70s than it is now the things that we find kind of fun now were shocking and, and confronting to people who were the audience at the time of these movies release and in about the decade after that we weren't as desensitized or de-attuned to horror at this level but nonetheless this is still entertaining that's why I have a Blu-ray of it. It's still watchable, it's still fun, and just seeing actors who are in there for a couple of days doing little bits and pieces, but still are really making their characters plausible within the absurdity of the of the story, really works for me. And Dr. Terror's House of Horrors and I, Monster, work really, really well as a double feature, because we see some of the range of Christopher Lee in particular. And I like that. I like the fact that I reevaluated my opinion of Christopher Lee as an actor by re-watching these two films. And in Dr. Terror's House of Horrors, Peter Cushing has the subtler role playing D Professor Shrek. And he does it well. The malevolence is a slow build in that movie for that particular character. And there's some interesting cinematography in it as well, particularly towards the end when the ensemble is starting to realise this guy isn't what they think he is. There's a really interesting green highlight 
coming down onto his head and onto the hat he's wearing, which is not a, a bright green light. It's a very subtle green highlight almost, which gives us that subconscious sense that this guy has is supernatural in some way. I didn't notice it in previous occasions, but sometimes you get those little bits of lighting and the, and the director of photography does a little bit of work which your brain inevitably interprets as being something worrying. Good double feature. Uh, Rewatching them today was a lot of fun for me and I enjoyed them. They're serviceable, they're solid, they're probably peak amicus in some ways. But though a lot of the Port Meadow films they did later were a lot gorier and a lot more confronting. Dr. Terrace House of Horrors at the start of that cycle worked and I Monster being an uh, iteration of a very familiar subject is rock solid as well mostly because of Christopher Lee. So that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, hit the notification bell, leave an emoji if you can't think of anything to say. You can also support the channel by becoming a channel member, or as an alternative, you can become a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash terrydogsmovies. We've got the Wednesday video coming out on Wednesday or Tuesday from the slow part of the planet, and then Science Fiction Saturdays coming up again which is Saturday if you're here, but if you're on some other parts of the world, it comes out on Friday. And we've got Luna scratching at the door. But either way, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some Portmanteau horror movies. You're going to love them. And I'll catch you next time.